Hello, Christ the King. Uh, today we conclude our initial three-part series about how the Anglican Church developed in the ancient period. Um, we will continue this series at a later time, focusing uh, with several weeks on the English Reformation. Uh, so know that more on this topic of our Anglican heritage is coming, but I hope you've enjoyed this initial three-part series. Today, we're going to look at a third ancient stream for the Anglican tradition, which is that of Benedictine monasticism. So let's talk about where monasticism came from. So after Constantine uh, converts, more or less, uh, to Christianity in the early 300s, uh, this means the end of persecution. Um, so Christians are no longer being uh, targeted for their faith uh, or martyred by the state. So the question then is how then could a Christian live a faithful life? So some Christians after Constantine uh, actually saw this newfound period of peace as a trap, as a snare of Satan, because in their minds, security and comfortable living were actually the greatest enemies of a faithful Christian life of discipleship. And so for them, the answer was to become a monastic. That is to flee from human society, leave behind your family and your wealth and go out uh, initially into the desert, uh, seeking to overcome the passions of the flesh um, and overcome all bodily temptations. Uh, to wage war with the devil. Um, initially, this took place uh, as individual monks in the deserts of Egypt in particular. We call this Anchorite monasticism, uh, St. Antony being the most famous example of the Desert Fathers. Over time, for a number of reasons, this gives way to uh, a communal or cenobitic form of monasticism uh, where monks live together um, apart from the world and yet with their brother monks. Um, and that's the kind of monasticism we'll be talking about today uh, with St. Benedict. So in the history of Western monasticism, uh, undoubtedly the most important figure is St. Benedict of Nursia. Um, and he lived in the late 400s, early 500s. So this is after uh, the fall of the Western Roman Empire in that period of chaos after that. Um, <clears throat> he uh, gives up his uh, wealth and prestige in society at about age 20 when he leaves it behind to become a hermit and uh, engaging in these rigorous ascetical uh, practices of fasting and self-denial, uh, living in a cave. And as was the case with these uh, extreme ascetics in Egypt, um, his extreme piety brings him disciples uh, who want to learn from him. So what's he going to do with all of his followers? He's going to start a small monastic community at Monte Cassino in Italy. He cuts down the sacred grove that had existed there, overturns its pagan altar, and forms a community there. He forms other communities as well, but this is the one that he's most known for because it's here that he'll serve as abbot. And it's here that he will write a rule, the rule of St. Benedict, that is a plan for how the community is going to organize its life together. So here's just a taste of it from the beginning. Listen carefully, my son, to the master's instruction and attend to them with the ear of the heart. Therefore, we intend to establish a school for the Lord's service. In drawing up its regulations, we hope to set down nothing harsh, nothing burdensome. The good of all concerned, however, may prompt us to a little strictness in order to amend faults and to safeguard love. Do not be daunted by fear and run away from the road that leads to salvation. It is bound to be narrow at the outset. But as we progress in this way of life and in faith, we shall run on the path of God's commandments our hearts overflowing with the inexpressible delight of love, never swerving from his instructions then, but faithfully observing his teaching in the monastery until death. 
we shall through patience share in the sufferings of Christ, that we may deserve also to share in this kingdom. Amen. So he sees his monastery as a training ground, as a school uh, for the Lord's service. And unlike some of the other monastic rules in the time, uh, his rule, he claims, is nothing harsh, nothing burdensome, um, only a little strictness in order to um, amend faults and safeguard love. Um, he admits up front this is going to be a difficult task, um, and yet he says the, the end result of the monastic life uh, will be this life uh, of faith and love, and it's a path that goes all the way until death. So I think one helpful way to think about uh, Benedictine monasticism are the three vows that Benedict's monks were required to take uh, if they wanted to, to join the monastery as a monk. <clears throat> and all of these work together to contribute to the, growths, the growth of the monk in the virtue of humility, which is a major theme of the rule. So the first vow is the vow of stability. Monks were not free to go from monastery to monastery, like the so-called gyro vagues of his day, leeching on the hospitality of different monasteries. <clears throat> Rather, they must stay in one place, that they're committed to living within that particular community exclusively until the time of their death. Second, the monks would have vowed fidelity to the monastic life that they would have participated fully in the life of the monastery at prayer and at work, and that they would seek to grow in moral uprightness and righteousness across all the aspects of their life. And then third, they would have vowed obedience, that the monks would obey the rule and the abbot. They'd obey them willingly and immediately. Uh, note that the abbot is not himself some kind of authoritarian dictator with absolute power. Rather, the abbot himself is subject to both God and the rule. So stability, fidelity, obedience, the three vows of Benedict's monks. <clears throat> um, what would it have been like to be a monk uh, in St. Benedict's monastery? Um, the phrase that develops later is ora et labora, uh, prayer and work. And so communal prayer was at the core of monastic life. And in fact, the monks would gather together eight times a day, or rather seven times during the day and then once at night uh, for this communal prayer. Um, in, this, uh, in these daily offices, if you will, the divine office, um, the monks would recite the Psalms um, and other parts of scripture. Um, most monks would come to know the entirety of the Psalter by heart. Um, one immediate result of this is that the monks would copy the Bible among uh, other books as well, which would be preserved for later times um, as a way of facilitating uh, the monks' prayer and study. But a longer term effect, and we'll talk about this more in a later series, is that at the time of the English Reformation, Thomas Cranmer, the great English reformer, uh, sees the value of these divine offices um, but instead of having seven or eight, he condenses it down to two, morning and evening prayer, to make it accessible to the laity, to those who are not themselves monks. <clears throat> okay, so this starts in Monte Cassino in Italy, but very quickly, these, uh, this approach to the monastic life spreads across Western Europe. Um, the monastery at Monte Cassino is burned in 589, uh, and monks then take the rule uh, to Rome. And from Rome, uh, with the support of the Pope, uh, Gregory the Great at this time, uh, the rule of St. Benedict spreads across Western Europe. And so this is how, uh, for our story, this is how Benedictine monasticism arrives in Britain. So in 597, uh, the Benedictines um, make it to Britain. Uh, Augustine of Canterbury, who we talked about last time, was himself a Benedictine. And so when Roman Christianity comes into the British Isles, uh, this includes all of these aspects of Benedictine monasticism. 
And by some estimates, uh, by the Middle Ages, fully half of the cathedrals of Britain were under Benedictine rule. Uh, by another count, by the year 1200, there were about 300 Benedictine houses in England. Um, so Benedictine spirituality finds a very uh, receptive soil in Britain. <clears throat> and so at the time of the Reformation, we'll see Cranmer uh, not dispensing with all of this, but in fact seeking to take a lot of the best aspects of uh, the Benedictine spirituality and incorporating that into his efforts at Reformation. All right, so let's think about how this applies to us as Anglicans in the 21st century. Um, just like Benedict's monks, uh, we too share a common life under a rule. Now we're not in a monastery, but we are gathered together um, as a parish at Christ the King. We don't have an abbot um, sort of organizing and supervising and ordering our spiritual lives, but we do have clergy. We don't have uh, a rule like that of St. Benedict, but we do have the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer that function as uh, a rule for our community. And so things like celebrating weekly communion, praying the daily office, practicing private devotion, um, this threefold rule um, is our Anglican way of pursuing God for the sake of the world. And so in a lot of ways, we can think of um, even our life as a parish in the Anglican tradition as being deeply indebted to some of these core Benedictine um, ideas about a rule of life. I think we can also make the case that all of us are also called to live out in some respect, these three Benedictine vows. So first, stability. Um, it's tempting to have a consumerist orientation to church. So we fall in and out of love with different churches or charismatic pastors and wander from one to another uh, without ever putting down roots. And I think the Benedictine uh, vow of stability helps us think about the need to really commit to and then fully participate in one particular parish, church community, um, rather than constantly moving around from one church to the next. Uh, because it's this stability that then allows us to uh, pursue the second vow of fidelity. So we are also called to fully participate in the sacraments and the rhythms of our parish and the Anglican way. Um, we're called to fully embrace um, the particular rhythms uh, of our church. And we mentioned that in the previous slide, things like uh, weekly communion, the daily office, um, spiritual friendships, uh, the threefold rule. Um, and then finally, obedience. Um, we don't have an abbot, but we are nonetheless called to obey Christ, our clergy, and one another in our parish. So these three vows of stability, fidelity, obedience, um, I think they're also very helpful for thinking about some of the core commitments that we should have um, as believers in Christ. So for our Zoom discussion on Tuesday, I want us to reflect on these three Benedictine vows. Which of them do you find the most relevant? Why? And then besides that, I want you to reflect on, do you have a rule of life? And if not, what do you think of this Anglican threefold rule? So those are the topics that I want to discuss. I hope we'll see you on Tuesday. Please leave a comment or a question once you've watched this so we can have some engagement in that capacity as well. And I hope you've enjoyed this series.